Thank you. Uh, my one request was for Todd was to keep the expectations low, uh, which is always the nerve-wracking part of a, of a bio. And I, I didn't know part of it was jumping out into the crowd. So yes, uh, you can set that expectation um, that I won't be doing that. Um, but I will, I will wander around. So uh, it's a pleasure to be here, to be the closing keynote. It's a particular honor. Thank you for staying around. Um, and I'm, I'm sure people have had uh, a great two days. That's all I've heard in, in the hallways and, and elsewhere. My journey to be at this stage and what I'm going to talk about really in many ways dates back to 1997, uh, which I guess dates me a little bit. And it was a year of kind of two big ideas. Uh, one is in 1997, I co-founded the software company Blackboard. Uh, the online learning company with my college roommate, Michael Chasen. And uh, it's kind of hard to go back in time and, and think about the world in 1997, but academic computing was sort of the stepchild of administrative computing. All the status and budgets and, and infrastructure was around processing payroll. Uh, and not that student records and SIS aren't important, um, but clearly the wiring of the classroom, let alone wireless, um, meant that there was going to be an opportunity to bring education online, both to augment the traditional classroom as well as for distance learning. And it's just amazing to see how that has developed uh, over time. And I really think we're still very much at the beginning of the Internet's impact on education. If you think about the challenges of education, how do we improve efficiency, quality, and access, and equity? And if we think about technology, the network and data and the opportunity to personalize and rich media and virtual reality, we were really at the beginning of taking those technologies and applying them to those problems. Um, and I'll connect a little bit to that in, in a moment. The other thing in 1997, which I had nothing to do about, didn't even know it had been written, but it would eventually foreshadow the work we're doing at Parchment, is uh, a committee um, out of ACRO wrote a report about the business case for making transcripts electronic and that was largely about efficiency, but starting to get into the broader question of what if records were machine-readable data? And what if as we start, in part because of online learning, because of the rich data that we're able to track around learners and competency, if we were to start creating a richer, more comprehensive learner record, what could that do to help connect universities to employers, to certification and licensing boards, to other stakeholders in, in a different way? So for me, the connection of those two really comes back to 1997. Now, a third thing happened in 1997. So my wife once saw me give a talk like this where I had that slide and there wasn't this third piece. I actually met her, coincidentally, in 1997. So now, ever since then, I always make sure to include that a third thing happened in 1997, <laughs> uh, which is uh, why I live in Arizona now, happily, uh, with our three kids. And, just to be clear, after that photo, they all started attacking each other, running around. <laughs> we're, we're not that kind of beautiful, happy, shiny-looking family that it might suggest. But for that moment, we were. Um, and I think about my wife a little bit in this talk, because um, when I first joined Parchment and, and started giving talks, she asked me a very simple question, which is, how do you make transcripts interesting? Like, I could get when you give a talk about like Blackboard and online learning, but like you're talking about Transcripts, like how do you make transcripts sexy? Um, and this isn't a room of registrars, so you don't necessarily intrinsically, I don't know how many people intrinsically find transcripts interesting. Registrars do, but most other normal people don't. Um, but I think they really are. I mean, when you think about the kind of currency that translates education into opportunities, it is the credential. It is the credential. Think about something like competency-based education. What a huge idea. But at the end of the day, if you don't communicate those competencies, then you've missed kind of the key element of the entire process. I mean, you know, hopefully it's better pedagogy and it's more reflective for the learner. But where the action is, is translating the rich data we have around what people know and how well they know it um, into admissions, employment, talent management, the different opportunities. And when you look at a transcript, it's sad not just because people don't think it's sexy, um, but it's sad because it hasn't been touched in a very long time. So that's the other piece to it. We've innovated so many parts of the educational process, but the record that we leave with is still textual, not visual. It's still limited to courses and credits, not capturing information in the LMS or co-curricular or other elements of the educational experience, internships and so on. 
it makes it in very difficult to see something. I mean, a GPA is an average of subject and achievement over time. That tells you almost nothing. We know that students may perform well and then head down, or more typically, they don't start off well, but then they um, perform quite nicely. There's no way to see that timeline of achievement. There's no way to see the courses they've taken by major subject area. Um, it's not machine-readable data, typically. So it's hard to bring into a talent management system or an applicant tracking system if you are an employer. And we're going to talk a little bit about how employers use records uh, a little later. So I think it's important, and I'm biased because I live in this world every day, because I think credentials are how we uh, access opportunities. It's the currency that translates education. And there's a great opportunity to, to help innovate it. I mean, when you think about it, this isn't the most beautiful slide in, in the deck. It, it literally comes off of kind of a whiteboard thing uh, that I, I often do. I, I use the analogy of putting kind of dye in the body before imaging, and it kind of lights up uh, the body in a way that helps doctors uh, perform procedures. If you think about the network where transcripts flow and other types of records and like verifications kind of flow, it lights up the pathways that our learners are using our education to pursue. Um, you know, high school students are sending transcripts to colleges for undergraduate admissions. Um, they're also moving more and more because of charter schools and vouchers and just the mobility uh, of students. Uh, universities are obviously issuing them for employment and licensing, but it also kind of loops back into higher education for graduate admissions, and I know that's what a lot of us in this room are focused on, and the pain of collecting academic transcripts for that purpose or uh, for transfer. Universities also send a lot of transcripts back into K-12 for employment uh, and licensing purposes and so on and so forth. So it's kind of interesting to think about the exchange data and what that lights up for the pathways behind our learners. And as I mentioned, it's at the intersection of a lot of the things that we talk about in terms of some of the key themes. Uh, credit transfer is a huge theme. All of these students that have some credit but no degree, who aspire when attending community college to ultimately graduate with that degree, and I think sort of talking about that a little bit before, uh, before my, my talk, um, but don't have the ability to put those credits uh, to work. Or the idea of giving credit for prior learning, or the idea of developing the co-curricular transcript, all of these come back again to how do we innovate the record. And certainly students are expecting this too. We do a lot of surveying of students. And not surprisingly, they want things digitally. They want it efficiently. They know they're going to continue to pursue education. And so they want that portability. They don't want an envelope inside an envelope inside another envelope. Um, and if the signature has been broken, the data aren't considered real or official. That's just not how they think. And they live not just in LinkedIn, and, but in Facebook and in other contexts and their credentials are an important part of their identity as well. Um, and they recognize that their college experience is so much more than courses and credits, and at a certain point would like to see that reflected as well. So that's kind of my pitch for why you might pay attention to the rest of this talk, is I think credentials are interesting, or they can be made interesting. And I think there's an opportunity to advance our programs and our institutional objectives by thinking about credential innovation you know, throughout the life course. Credentials are how we certify knowledge. It's how I know you know what you say you know, whether it's Marketo certification or Salesforce certification or an IT certification, a certificate program, or a finance uh, MBA. It's how are we discover talent and recruit um, based on the credentials as kind of a signal uh, behind that knowledge certification. It's also how we filter candidates and discriminate not in the bad sense of discrimination, but differentiate. And that's one of the awkward things about credentials. Because as education providers, we want to empower every one of our students with a credential that's going to advance them. But at the same time, we know that the other side of it is trying to filter and select you know, based on those credentials as well. And then it's how we articulate learning within the enrollment process. Um, you know, Todd was kind enough to give you a little bit of sense of the work we do at Parchment. This is what it's all about, is helping uh, to turn credentials into opportunity. So I really learn a lot more in a conversation. So what I'd love to do is just tee up a couple of ideas, a couple of themes, um, and then we can dive into a discussion around them. So I'll, I'll kind of move through it. If I say anything that you would disagree with or agree with or want to go deeply, you know, we've got all these notepads and pens. Please write it down in the moment. 
and then I'm, I'm really looking forward to, uh, to the discussion we'll have and, and learning. Um, I'll talk a little bit about uh, the credential innovation, kind of a macro view, um, and then provide two examples. One of kind of innovating the credential visually, the other in terms of employment engagement, and then we can laugh, we can cry, we can discuss, wherever, wherever it ultimately goes. So one of my favorite quotes, and I'm not this deep, I actually read Us Weekly. Uh, I am of, of the moment, um, but it happens to be a quote that I really do love, uh, which is Henry David Thoreau, who wrote that all of our inventions are but improve, improve means to unimproved ends. And I think that's a particularly important thing to keep in mind with, with ed tech, because there's a lot of opportunity for flash and sizzle, um, and really thinking more deeply about you know, what is the problem that it solves, and, and how do we really solve that problem, which usually doesn't involve technology, it involves people. You can have the best early alert system in the world, but if you don't have good advisors, you know, it's a pretty open question about the impact that that's you know, going to have. So for me, when I think about credential innovation, it kind of comes down to three basic problems, the ends that we're trying to address. The first, which I won't dwell on, is, is just very simply, credentials still are paper-based. They're printed and mailed, and your programs have to open that mail and scan it and index it and evaluate it, and students have to fax in transcript request forms, and you know, uh, when they graduate and they want to kind of put that credential to work in their professional identity, they're still getting a beautiful paper copy, but again, they live online in lots of different contexts. So uh, there's an opportunity to make it digital, and in that sense, to make it more portable and actionable uh, for the learner. I think the second problem, which is a much deeper problem, is that credentials are increasingly kind of fragmented. And it's fragmented in a few different ways. Um, one is, there are obviously multiple credentials per field. So if I'm a nurse, I don't know if I want to go to the hospital in my neighborhood and figure out which credential I should access from them in their training program or my community college or my four-year institution, brick and mortar and online. Um, there are so many different variations of nursing credentials depending on my field and the level at which I want to practice and the certification and licensing. And it becomes incredibly confusing to navigate the right credential uh, for me in terms of what I'm trying to accomplish. There are projects like the Credential Engine. How many people have heard of the Credential Engine? Does that ring a bell? Good, that means I'm adding value by sharing something you didn't already know. Um, but it's funded by Lumina. It's part of something called the Credential Transparency Initiative. And it's an effort by credential providers to post basic descriptive data about their programs to a central search engine. So that now I can actually go, and it's live now, you can go to the credential engine and search across a ton of certificate and degree programs in a particular field and say, this is what I want to ultimately accomplish, which are the programs that are available. And I'd recommend it because I think it's an important marketing dimension of any program is to make that credential more discoverable in contexts like the uh, credential engine. The second is we see institutions diversifying, and you're obviously at the forefront of that. You've got two hour and two day and two week and two month and two year, you know, variations of all of these different programs. And that can create complexity. And institutions don't typically manage them centrally. We think of our degree programs as something the registrar needs to run, but there's a lot of stuff happening with our seal and signature that learners are putting to work. So how do we kind of create a common credentialing platform that supports all of these different kind of programs we want to have market value? The third is the typical individual is earning multiple credentials throughout their lives. And in this day and age, they don't want to hear that they don't get ownership of that data. They don't want to be told, you have to come back to me every time you want to access that record. If I can access a ton of restaurants through OpenTable, I ought to be able to access my educational providers and request and collect and manage those credentials in, in one place to be able to move forward uh, in my career. And then employers are trying to figure out all of these things as well. How do they interpret the different kind of credentials that all come from the same institution? How do they differentiate them and understand which is the right one for them, let alone all the different kinds of credentials that people apply? I don't know about you. I mean, all of us are employers. We hire, and I was pointing to Todd in particular, but we get resumes with all sorts of certificates and certifications, and we have to try to make sense of, is this something meaningful? And again, that's a little bit part of the credential engine, is you can go 
and see what kind of assessment model do they use? What are the criteria for credentials? Is it an accredited program? Things like that to, to bring more meaning into those programs. So unification and kind of making sense of credentials, I think, is a, is a second major end uh, to which we can work. And then third, which I've already touched a little bit on, so I don't want to be too repetitive, is that credentials are kind of opaque. Um, and that's ironic or paradoxical, given we've never had more information about learner outcomes, but they're very opaque. Kevin Carey has this great line that a diploma tells you uh, less than a prisoner of war can uh, uh, report under the Geneva Convention, name, rank, and serial number. Um, and that's sort of true, right? It just says it's a degree verification mechanism or it's a symbolic document. Outside the US, interesting, fun fact, the diploma is the main document in most countries other than the US. What we use transcripts for, diplomas tend to be the main thing. Um, but in the US, it's just more of a symbolic document. So how do we take advantage of two things? One, the amazing infrastructure universities have put in place to know more about what someone knows and how well they know it and what they've done. Co-curricular systems like OrgSync, learning management systems, not, and of course the student information systems. We have a much richer data model that we can use. Um, and then second, how do we take advantage of digital to embed machine readable data to do some more things which I'll, which I'll share. So I think the macro trend around credentialing is not just digital but machine readable data, um, new kinds of credentials, and I'll put some meat on those bones in a moment in terms of what we're talking about. And then last but not least, ownership of the credential by the individual, empowerment of the individual with those credentials. So what do I mean by you know, new types or innovation of credentials? These are three examples. Um, on the left-hand side, I was, I was a thespian. So I always try to remember stage right, stage left. Um, so stage right, your left, you see an example of um, transcripts with embedded links. So now uh, you can link from a course uh, ID into the course description in the course catalog, get a little bit more information. University of California, San Diego, the grade is actually a link into the grade distribution, which is you know, kind of interesting, bringing transparency into what does that performance really mean relative uh, to the other students who, who took that course. Could be a diploma that links into an e-portfolio where you have the uh, evidence of learning, or even think about these as stacked, a diploma linking into a traditional transcript, uh, which links into the evidence of learning uh, for each of the courses. We can bring a richness um, to it. Second, which I'll go into a little bit more deeper, is the idea of visual credentials. Um, Elon did a lot of research, and again, I'm gonna talk about it, I don't wanna be repetitive, um, but did a lot of research about their co-curricular transcript. This is more of an undergraduate example. And they found that most employers used it in the context of an interview. It's their way of a proxy of work experience for a recent graduate. But a traditional textual transcript is terrible in the moment of an interview, it's hard to make sense of. So created this visual format that makes it very clear the brands where you've interned and uh, I'll, I'll talk more about it uh, in that case study. Or the ability to integrate into your social profiles and make it easier to verify your education and provide access to this information. That's what's happening today. What I believe is gonna happen over time and what we're beginning to see some early examples is not just institutions creating new record types with new record formats because of data, but I think we're ultimately gonna see the personalization and contextualization of academic credentials. And those are two big words, personalization and contextualization. But what I mean is sending a transcript or my university record for employment is different than admissions. To licensing is different than employment. And when I'm sending it to Google, it's different than Accenture. So University of Indiana is working on a project they call the Cover Sheet Project, where you can take uh, based on the specific destination you're sending your transcript to, you will as a student be able to take certain courses that you've completed and highlight them in the cover sheet. So you're still sending the full transcript because they're concerned about selective disclosure, but it's an opportunity for you to personalize and tailor your official record from the institution in a way to that particular employer. So not to stereotype, but if I'm sending to Accenture, I might want to highlight management consulting kind of courses, maybe social sciences and how I can speak well and think well and, and be analytical and write well. 
Uh, whereas maybe Google just cares about not the stereotype, but just like, did I do well in math and computer science? And I'm sure that's not true, but you know, just to give that example. So different kinds of records contextualize for the different purposes, contextualize to the specific destination within those pur purposes. Um, I think that's where we are moving. And particularly online programs, and particularly programs that are aligned to employment pathways, I think an amazing promise, an amazing charter to have with your incoming students is this is what you will have on the other side of the program. And this is who you will be able to use it with. Um, it both drives motivation, and we talked about this at dinner last night, the importance of motivation, um, but it drives motivation to take advantage of, of the program, and it makes crystal the promise um, of each educational institution to their students as they pursue those, those different opportunities. Does that make sense? Hopefully it does. So two, uh, two case studies. Um, the first is, is Elon, which I began to introduce. Um, Elon is, is a liberal arts college in North Carolina. It's an undergraduate institution, I think. Yeah, it's college, so that doesn't always mean you don't offer graduate programs these days, but I'll guess it doesn't offer graduate programs. Um, and a big part of it is that co-curricular experience. It includes study abroad, but it also includes a lot of co-curricular stuff um, that you can do on campus. Uh, we've done a lot of research uh, with students, and students say, not surprisingly, that they'd like to see more information in their record, in, in particular things that come out of that co-curricular. Particularly a first-time graduate, what employers are trying to understand is a proxy for work experience. What does your college experience tell me in the vocabulary of work experience? And partly that's just raw achievement and completion, but a lot of it is also what you did, right? Did you lead? Did you create? Did you engage? Did you serve? All those things that come out of the co-curricular experience. And you can see some of the major buckets. Now, Elon had a co-curricular transcript. Um, and as you can see, it looked and felt, and I like to joke, sort of tasted just like a traditional academic transcript because that's what a real transcript looks like. This is what a real transcript looks like. I'm obviously being uh, a little bit facetious, but the view was it had to follow, uh, my academic background is in sociology, and one of my favorite words from sociology is isomorphism, which is this tendency to mirror or mimic another person or organization or practice to, because that's how we provide legitimacy. So like, how do you pay your people? Well, I do benchmarking and then I pay them at the median, you know, and that just creates legitimacy around, you know, how you do salaries. And uh, universities in particular do a lot of things because that's just the way universities do them. And it, it's kind of where our legitimacy comes from. Um, and so this is isomorphism in transcript. This is looking legitimate. But as I mentioned earlier, and I kind of already ruined the lead a little bit, uh, when they went out to employers, they found that this was not at all useful to them. Um, it, it was not a sensible way. For example, internships are just listed as internship. Um, but there's so much more, obviously, behind that. And so they developed a, a visual transcript. They have five major kinds of service learning experiences, and you can see your engagement across those five. Um, looking at it over time with embedded links to go into deeper information around particular experiences, if there are things that you can link into, like work products or campaign information. Uh, internships pop pretty dramatically because now you have the brand logo of the internship provider, and those can hyperlink into the uh, employer's descriptions of their internship programs. Um, study abroad is important. Uh, and then you can see the distribution of what you did uh, by time, by, by type. And there's a whole bunch of stuff that you have to think about to make something like this work. For example, do students have the right to control what's on here? Well, probably yes. Um, if I was a president of the College of Democrats as a college student and since have become more politically conservative uh, or I'm applying to a politically conservative cause, I'm applying to Heritage Foundation or the opposite. You know, um, I may or may not want that disclosed, um, just to use 
but apparently in our society today is the most sensitive topic, your political affiliation. Uh, who cares about your sexual identity or any number of other topics? It's your political affiliation uh, that people want to be most sensitive uh, about. Um, so of course they should be able to think editorially about what they want to show. Um, at UC San Diego, it's part of a fascinating meeting around whether um, being a barista in, at Starbucks uh, is something that should be in here. You know, one group said, no, it's not just like what you're coincidentally doing while in college uh, that we're going to document and certify. But another group says, wait a minute, my opportunity set to do these things is driven in part by the degree to which I'm working my way through college. And, and uh, if that's an important context to understand this, which brings to another point, if you haven't done a lot of things, you don't want to provide an empty one. So what's, you know, what's the meaningful threshold? Um, and then how do we make this available again at the beginning of the program so that it really becomes this reflective device? It's the palette upon which a student can paint um, as they're developing. They do integrate it into LinkedIn. Uh, you know, you never want to share uh, disclosure. Uh, you never want to share your academic transcript on social profiles, a lot of personal sensitive information in there. But documents like this are designed to be more uh, public. Um, and we do, again, we do a lot of survey. When you talk to students, that social sharing is a very big part of it. Now, it's actually a little different than when you think. I imagine if I ask people where do students share their diplomas, how many people would say LinkedIn is kind of the first, at least what I thought. So I'm probably giving away that it's not the answer, so people will keep their hands down. But I would have thought kind of left brain, right brain, it's LinkedIn. That's not at all what we see. What we see is most of the social sharing is on Facebook. But in particular, it's on Facebook for, for, for the social pride and accomplishment of completion. There is, you know, for those who are on the marketing side, there is a tremendous amount of social energy and goodwill associated with the ability to put your diploma um, and share it and integrate it into social as that accomplishment and that attachment of yourself to the education provider around what you've been able to do first in my family, generation, et cetera. So we actually see most of the energy is around that use of credentials, at least near graduation. And then it certainly moves into the professional side. Um, and you can see that pride in themselves, 78%, and accomplishment, 70%. And then lower down is uh, other purposes around employment. Elon has done research on how do employers look at the visual transcript. You can see in the big boxes, 82. Uh, actually, I have to move around here to make it a little easier, sorry. 82%. It's easy to understand. Probably the big one is 81% think it differentiates the applicant. 79% thinks it um, you know, creates a different uh, picture. Um, and when they talk to employers about content, it's really about leadership um, and those kinds of experiences that they are uh, most interested in. So hopefully that uh, paints a little bit of a picture and just opens the mind to think differently. What do we know about our students where are they trying to go with their credentials? And if we kind of broke apart this belief that there's one size fits all, are there new kinds of records that we might develop that differentiate our programs and that really help turn those education into opportunities? And most importantly, do we have an employer ecosystem that we can talk to to say, what would you want to know? So that these are not kind of the drunk looking for the keys where the light is brightest. This is about uh, you know, where the keys were most likely left. This is about where the employer is most interested in, in digging deeper. So everything I just shared is in a, a paper that Elon published in one of the uh, regional ACLO journals. And, um, you know, I don't know if decks are being shared, but uh, you can certainly uh, access this deck, and I'll give my email later where you can access it. The second example I'd like to talk a little bit about is uh, transcript flows. Um, and so, we survey, again, students. This is becoming a common statement I'm making. Um, and ask them, what do they want to do with their credentials? And kind of, what do they plan? And uh, about 61%, you know, I want to use this for employers. I want to use my credentials for employers, whether it's diplomas, transcripts, other kind of records. And again, I think that number could be bigger if the record was more responsive to employers. And then a large number obviously plan to continue on their education. Either immediately or they just have a sense that over time, they're going to come in and out of the higher education system, and their records are going to be relevant to them. And so it really you know, caused us at Parchment to ask a question, you know, which is, if a large number of students do see relevance of their academic records with employers, 
to what extent are academic records actually being sent to employers? Um, how many employers really are interested in transcripts? So I see a shaking of the head, and you're kind of where I was coming in. My guess is not a lot of employers. And so we kind of ran the numbers. And I know this doesn't fit the slide before, but a different uh, study that we said said about 71% of students want to use their records to pursue employment opportunities, and about 75% think they're relevant to educational opportunities. So we'll do audience participation, even if I'm not going to jump out there uh, into the crowd. So what would be the guess um, around the percent of transcripts that about 800 colleges that we work with um, are sending their transcripts to, a percent of their transcripts that are going for employment purposes or to employers? What's that? 20%. OK. 30? 3%. All right. So very, very little, like 3%. You know, 20%, it's not the main purpose, but there's a, a healthy number. Um, well, the answer is around 10%. So somewhere in the middle, the wisdom of the crowd. You get, <laughs> you get the average. Uh, so about 10%. Now, you know, depending on your perspective, glass half empty, wait a minute, only 10%, and yet 71% of students thought it was relevant for that purpose. You know, that's a gap we can look to close. But the flip side is, I was kind of with the head shaking or the 2%. You know, I thought it'd be much lower. So 10% was actually a little bit of a, of a surprise. And then, you know, education, uh, the vast majority, 80%. And if you're wondering what the remaining 10% are, very surprised to find out a lot of transcripts sent for like good in student insurance. And like all of these like long tails, like why is Geico getting a ton of transcripts? Uh, it's this long tail of other purposes that fall into this personal or other kind of bucket, and then depending on how you kind of define scholarships and fellowships and, and things of that nature as well fall into that 10%. So can you guess which employers, uh, which sector are the biggest collectors of transcripts for employment? Wow, yes, I didn't, I didn't see this one coming. Um, so you're obviously uh, a lot smarter than I. And, you know, again, over dinner, I, I come to appreciate that probably a lot of the programs here are in part serving teachers and school leaders who then uh, put it to work. So yes, education is the largest, so that's good to know. We value our, our transcripts. Um, and so this is going into K-12 uh, for you know, all sorts of um, uh, purposes, employment and promotion and compensation, uh, K-12 school leaders as well, and then certainly within higher education. Uh, but in, within a typical university, though, unbelievably fragmented. Like the local academic unit tends to handle things like adjunct, and lecturers and online. Um, the dean of faculties tends to handle tenure track. Um, and then HR will tend to handle university administrators. And so it's a very fragmented uh, kind of uh, landscape. Now, when I ask universities and school districts, why do you collect it? If you actually look at the content, uh, the answer is almost universally no. We are collecting it as a way of verifying degree completion. Um, and so that you know is disheartening, um, because and again again it speaks to when why are we producing a record and requiring it if it's not telling us anything that a simple one zero yes no couldn't have otherwise uh, provided and maybe there are exceptions in this room and I'd love to hear about it. In terms of the next biggest industries, um, government, aerospace, defense, healthcare, and and professional, and you can see some of the logos that are associated with it. Now, government's a little bit complicated because government, we have to do better in breaking out. Government includes all of the professional certification and licensing boards that, gov you know, that the states run. So that's a different kind of idea than the government as employer, which is also big, the State Department, NSA, the military, which is also a different idea than on the federal level than local. A uh, large number of sheriff and police departments, um, again, because I think their compensation certification, participation in certain programs include continuing education credits through local institutions, and they need to collect the transcript as part of it. But if there's something that I see that's common to all of these, they're in regulated industries. So that 10% of volume is generally going to the kinds of employers who are in regulated industries who either by policy or practice or law have the checklists, and they need to make sure that everything, including your educational background, has been validated and certified, and they rely on the transcript to do that. 
So the question is, how do we add value you know, beyond that? Um, interestingly, they are still, you know, if education is still getting a lot of paper stuff, they're way behind in how they collect it, which creates a lot of operational friction. So they have these centralized email addresses like jobs at or college recruiting at. So they have central processing for how they're collecting uh, from academics. But generally speaking, they're still getting a lot of paper. Um, so you've got the record and the content, but also the, the format. Um, some industries more than 70%, but many still 30 to 50% are, are paper. So JP Morgan, only about one in four uh, records they get from universities are electronic, and the Army, State Department, Navy, um, less than 10% electronic. So as we think about um, how do we create a more useful record for employers, how do we also create the relationship with the employers and provide it in the format, in the way, and then also the student who's going to use it to be discovered through social profiles and, and otherwise. So. The last piece I'd share is there's some interesting variation which reminds you that all education is local. So there's no one way to think about bucketing higher education. There's a bunch of different ways. In this case, we did it using Barron Selectivity Index because um, these were largely about undergraduate uh, programs and undergraduate transcripts. So institutions that Barron describes as non-competitive to competitive, the industries they tend to send to are family services, food products, hotels, restaurant, leisure, retail. Whereas the institutions that Barron's ta targets as very competitive to most competitive, their transcripts are going to banking, capital markets, diversified financial services. So it's just to say that obviously your degree programs, your local employment, the degree to which you have a kind of a national footprint and brand and employer relationship versus local, uh, about 45% of um, employment related transcripts are sent in the same state as the college sending it which is a higher amount than graduate or transfer or other purposes. So this is, this is about local uh, for some institutions, national for others, and it's about figuring out again that very particular ecosystem at the intersection of it because you get very different answers depending. So if you're a glass half full person, 10% uh, is a lot, and a lot of different kinds of employers do value and rely on academic records. But if you're a glass uh, half empty, it's still a fraction of obviously the charter of the institution in terms of helping to impact the career trajectory of our learners. So I think there's three things we can do. Um, one is we could just make the current academic record easier to request and verify and, and more efficient to access um, and take advantage of the data about where it's going to create those conversations. Second, to use those conversations to really learn what do you want to know about us? You probably know our program. You're collecting from our graduates. What would a better record look like for you? And in what formats would you get it? And then last but not least, take advantage of digital to do that. Because the beauty of digital is not that you can film the play, in kind of the classic example, but you can create a whole new art form. In other words, the, the film, the movie. We can create new kinds of records because the same data it's trivial to make it look, feel, and present differently to different audiences. So uh, two final thoughts. Um, one is, hopefully, we put the, the smiley face on the credential. Um, you know, I've convinced you that it's worth thinking a little bit about that final step of your programs. Um, and I think it's on two dimensions. One is, where are our students moving on to? And is this record responsive to that purpose? But then it really comes back to marketing in many ways. Because that's such a powerful, especially at this stage when it's still early, a very powerful differentiator, I think. That when you complete, this is what we'll be able, you'll be able to say about yourself. It's that personalization of it um, and the authenticity of that to the stakeholders that you're progressing on to. Um, as well as just the milestone of completion and the kind of energy that that generates. Um, and then it's obviously about the relationship with those uh, destinations as well. And then second, um, another one of my favorite quotes is Einstein. He, the story is that he was giving a speech about uh, some you know, advanced physics uh, topic and uh, someone came up and, and asked him a, a really long-winded question, a very complex question, and he said, look, you have to understand there are only five people in the world who truly understand my theory of relativity and I'm not one of them. Um, so 
that's to end on a little bit of a humble note because, you know, while I spent a lot of time working with universities, I'm not, you know, in your shoes. I'm not teaching. I'm not advising. I'm not recruiting. I'm not the registrar. You know, the, the depth of experience and opportunity is, is obviously there, which is what makes me excited to have a conversation. So thank you for letting me put some of these ideas out here. My email is very easy. It's Matthew, M-A-T-T-H-E-W. We don't hire any Matthews at Parsnip. Um, <laughs> Uh, but uh, so please email me and um, you know if the conference organizers don't post the deck I'm, I'm happy to send it and continue the conversation but would love to have a discussion so hopefully I'm on track time-wise to, to do that good yes yes yeah, so degree fraud is a, is a really big issue. And obviously, with the growth of online, it, it, it only becomes bigger. Uh, one of the weird kind of connections of my lives is in the main uh, sociological journal. They're actually for education, sociology of education. There was actually a study of employer perceptions of university degrees. And it found that the made-up university degrees were valued the highest by the employer, which is incredibly depressing. You know, names like Northwest Central. You know, it's like a contradiction of terms uh, right there as I think about it. Um, so degree fraud is, is very real. And I think there's two dimensions to it. And it gets to an earlier slide. There's just degree fraud, which now, like all types of fraud in the online world, is, is bigger and bigger. And so I think we're going to see blockchain as a technology get applied to credentialing so that there's an open infrastructure, a global ledger that allows for, um, you know, for employers and others very simply to, to, to degree check. Um, and then the other element of it gets back to the growth of programs. The most typical misrepresentation is I completed a certificate program, but I don't say that, right? I just say, you know, I went to American University. I just say the Kaugad Business School. And I leave it to the imagination of the employer to assume an MBA, when in reality, you know, it could have been two hours, two weeks, two months, exactly. So I think that's a very real issue, and it's another benefit of, of digital is we can make that process you know, much more efficient and scalable. Thank you. Yes? Yeah. It does, in that case. But that's another area, like I mentioned, the barista, different institutions are approaching it different ways. So there are some uh, who are creating co-curricular transcripts that are self-reported, doesn't have the seal or signature, and it's just a way of helping students curate. But most, I think, view it as, if I'm recruiting a student here in part for the total learning experience at my institution, then my record should reflect that total learning experience. And they're investing in the infrastructure and the practices to be able to track and store, uh, store that information. And Elon is one of those that does track and store their medical schools that are doing this as part of their research you know, projects behind it. But uh, like most things, you know, the, the work and the impact is in the program design and the evaluation and the tracking, you know, not to put what we do down, but it's not in then how you represent it. That's relatively trivial. So I think that's an important observation. Other questions or examples you've seen? Yes. That's a good question. Um, I guess it's, I hadn't thought about that. It's mainly this time forward. Digital diplomas and certificates are a little different. It's more common to say, again, largely, oftentimes digital diplomas Many times, the funding is actually coming from alumni and development. Their perspective is, I could send a mug, or for the same amount, I could give them something they actually value, will engage, register for, claim, and use, and then socially project their affiliation with all of the kind of ways that that exponentially spreads online. So, um, so there they are going back for five years or so uh, and issuing out more broadly. But I think it's a go-forward model for the most part. Are there institutions that are beginning to do this? You know, are any of your programs 
um, you know, providing digital or new kinds of records as part of your completion? Are there examples you might share? Yeah, please. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't want to overstate it. I mean, I could probably name about 10, um, but then after that, it, it, you know, so maybe it's 20, 25. Um, we are now at a point where the databases exist. There are several different service providers who have 30, 40, 50 years of course catalog indexed. And you do hit the important point, which is you need a stable link, and you need that stable link to go to the right, you know, semester instructor specific version of that course description. And I think we're at a point where that code has been cracked. So now it's simply a kind of an integration work of exporting that from your catalog and then using the course ID to kind of merge the HTML into the PDF transcript. So it's still a small number, but that is one of the major use cases of it is to simplify the transfer evaluation because that's typically what happens is you have to call up the institution if you know this better. Right, and again, if you think about the beauty of you know, digital, machine-readable data, while a transcript could still digitally be a PDF with two pages, embedded with it can be an XML file that is the equivalent of a million pages, right? That syllabus could just be in the XML file, as well as the course catalog. I mean, you can, that payload can be quite big and still not affect the ergonomics of how people use a transcript, which eliminates those kinds of frustrations. But that's still pretty rare today. Yeah, I mean, I think that starts, these ideas bleed a little bit into e-portfolios, and particularly the use of e-portfolios, you know, for more summative, as opposed to kind of the pedagogical uses of e-portfolios. And so there are, you know, um, institutions. Um, Indiana actually has a project out of the University of Indiana where the idea is that, yes, a student will have a portfolio that has their academic transcript, but will also have recommendations from faculty members, from, you know, third-party internship providers that they took, you know, during the program, things like that. And there are some institutions that support attachments, where when they're mailing out the official record, allow for attachments like letters of recommendation. So I did teach. I'm good with long pregnant pauses. Uh, make the most of our time. Other questions? I am between you and flights and home. All right, so we will call it, we will call it a keynote. Um, Thank you so much, uh, and I look forward to continuing the conversation by email.